What makes the achievement of emotional sobriety so difficult is the habits we have, the patterns we have in our behavior, the habitual ways that we've come to think about things. We have to really become aware of those things in order to challenge them because the consciousness that has created a lot of the problems in our life cannot solve it, cannot change things. So what happens is, is the first step is waking up. When you've got a problem and you don't transform the problem, you transmit it. But the good news is, is that when you start to embrace recovery, you also transmit that recovery. And those around us benefit from the work we're doing as well. As we raise our emotional sobriety, or like I say, as our level of differentiation, it really becomes contagious and the differentiation of those around us also starts to, to be raised. Tonight, we are looking at step 10. And once again, I just want to put it in the context. And I talked about it last time is that at step six and seven, we really pivoted right towards developing the best possible attitude that we could have in life, the best possible attitude in terms of our relationship with ourselves, the best possible attitudes in relationships to others and the best possible attitude we can have in relationship to life itself. Now, as always that happens is, is that when the steps build up a charge, like in the first step, we admit it, we're powerless, our lives have become unmanageable. We hit this existential crisis, right? And that needs to be resolved. And that's what happens in step two when we get hope. Well, as we're now reaching for the best possible attitude in life, we are told what that looks like. So in step eight and nine, we get the template in terms of our best possible attitude towards ourselves and others. And even with life itself, we're told that when there are problems, first take a look at yourself. Don't focus out there. Don't externalize the issue. Turn into yourself, not with self-blame, not with self-derision, but with a concern and a focus on and a curiosity of what can I do differently here? How can I learn from the mistake that I've just made? So that's what we're doing. We are really trying to establish a new relationship to the mistakes that we're making in our life. And we're first doing that by looking at and going back over in terms of the wreckage of our past, not only with others, but with ourselves. And we're trying to learn from those mistakes. Bill says it explicitly that in step eight, we're trying to extricate from looking at all of the harm we've done. What are the patterns here? What are the habitual ways that we function so we can increase our awareness of our behavior? Now, we're not just becoming aware of it, but we're going ahead and now we're taking what we're learning and we're bringing it into our life. That's the great thing about the work in the 12 steps. It's both a psychodynamic and a behavioral program at the same time. You develop insights into yourself. You develop awareness. Of, of yourself and how you're functioning with others. And then you use that to behave differently, to create new experiences in our life. So it's a wonderful combination of both psychodynamic therapy and behavioral therapy. It's bringing those both together. Now, we first now go back and look in our past about developing this orientation to life, but we can't just go back and live in the past. We need to bring it into the here and now. And I said to you last time, and, I, I, and it was an epiphany I had when I was sharing with you guys, is step 10 is about bringing all that we're learning into the here and now. 
It is an integrative step. We are integrating what we've learned to do in steps eight and nine, and we're integrating this into our life today. Step 10 reads, right, um, that we become, you know, immediately aware when we are wrong, we promptly admitted it, right? It's that kind of a thing. We continued to take personal inventory. And when we are wrong, we promptly admitted it. It means that we're living our life now with a greater degree of consciousness. Now, everything we've done up to step nine has now brought us to this point where we're now engaging our life with a much greater degree of, of self-awareness and consciousness than we've ever had before. And we need that in, in terms of achieving emotional sobriety. That increase in our self-awareness and our in living life consciously and having this curiosity and this willingness to go ahead and own things, right? This is all a result of the humility that we've been cultivating through all of these steps. So it's a phenomenal thing. So now when we come to step 10. And what we're told in this step is that there's three different ways to be focusing our awareness on what we're doing today. Bill talks about three different ways, right? The first thing he talks about is what he calls a spot check inventory. Then he talks about kind of reviewing the day. And then he calls what I like to call the recovery checkup. Today, we are going to focus on the spot check inventory, right? And let me tell you what that is, and we'll talk about how to do one, right? So, but this all begins with Bill saying in step 10, because this is what we've learned up to this point, and he's just repeating it, is that it's a spiritual axiom, and this is a quote from step 10, it's a spiritual axiom that every time we are emotionally disturbed, no matter the cause, there is something wrong with us. Well, we have now learned something about what's wrong with us, that our emotional dependence has generated these claims and demands that have turned into expectations that have then now become these unenforceable rules that we, you know, demand people adhere to. So when I'm upset, it's because things aren't going the way that I think they should go. We know that now. Now that's where our humility comes in, is that when I'm upset that I understand this is my issue. This is very important in the achievement of emotional sobriety is that we drop the word blame from our language. It's not about blaming someone else or blaming ourselves. It's trying to understand what's going on here. So Bill calls this spot check inventory at one point in, in that chapter in the 12 and tells, he goes, the quick inventory is aimed at our daily ups and downs. The quick inventory is aimed at our daily ups and downs, especially those where people or new events throw us off balance and tempt us to make mistakes. Oh, I love that. Throw us off balance and tempt us to make mistakes. He goes, a spot check inventory taken in the midst of such a disturbance, right? Being thrown off balance, right? A spot check inventory taken in the midst of such a disturbance can be a very great value or great help and quieting stormy emotions. Wow. Now, he goes on to say this. He goes, in all these situations, we need self-restraint. We need an honest analysis of what is involved, a willingness to admit when the fault is ours, and an equal willingness to forgive when the fault is elsewhere. We need not be discouraged when we fall into error of our old ways, for these disciplines are not easy. We shall look for progress, not for perfection. 
we shall look for progress, not for perfection. So what does this spot check inventory need to involve? Well, I wrote down a few things that I think are important and I've kind of laid them out as a protocol. So you can think about kind of walking through this protocol. If you get to that point where you are knocked off balance and you find yourself upset. So the first step is this restraint. Hit the pause button. We've got to live in the space between the stimulus and our reaction. If we're going to achieve emotional sobriety, we can't do the, what Herb likes to call ready, fire, aim, right? You know, you're not going to be a good, you know, marksman if that's what you're doing in your life. It needs to be ready, aim, fire. So we need to hit this pause button. We got to try not to react. Sometimes we do that. Well, we'll talk about that more. But what we want to do is to try not to react because our goal here is to act on what we're experiencing, not react to it. I'll say that again. Our goal in this spot check inventory is to act on what we're experiencing, not to react to it. Now, to get ourselves to act to it, we need to do the next thing. So we next asked ourselves, what does my felt experience mean? Meaning, where do I experience this feeling in my body? How would I describe what I'm experiencing in my body? What are the sensations that I'm experiencing? Now, we're doing that to bring our awareness internally to start to focus on what's going on for us. The next thing we need to do is to see if we can now find the words that accurately tie into the experience that we're having. So what is this feeling I'm experiencing? Can I find the words that most accurately reflect what I'm experiencing in this moment? As we name it, we can start to tame it. But without putting that label on it, we will just be lost with our reaction. I think it's important to bring some curiosity at this point. Is this a familiar reaction or feeling? In other words, is my past now defining my present? Is this an old feeling that I've had before that I'm projecting into this moment? Because when I've got unresolved issues, things that I haven't taken care of or trauma I haven't dealt with, it's very likely these things are going to get activated. And then that doesn't have anything to do with what's happening. That has to do with what's happening with me, not with what somebody else is doing. It's what I'm doing. This is why Don Miguel Ruiz was so clear on saying nobody can hurt you. If you're feeling hurt, you're associating what's going on to some experience you've had in your life. Well, we understand that as we achieve emotional sobriety. Nobody hurts me. If I'm upset, I'm upsetting myself. If I'm bringing something up, I'm bringing it up. You're not bringing it up to me. I'm bringing it up and I'm upsetting myself with it. This step involves asking ourselves, when have I experienced something like this in the past? So I can start to get clear on what's going on for me. And then I got to get to what I what we've talked about before. What is the claim or the demand that I have in this situation? How am I expecting you to be different? How am I thinking that you should be behaving? What are you supposed to be doing or what's supposed to be happening right now? What expectation, you know, has this generated? These claims or demands. And what is the unenforceable rule that's being violated that's really pissing me off that you're not following it, damn you? God, if you really love me, you would do this, wouldn't you? No, that's a rule I have. Now, here's the important thing in this spot check inventory. 
And now I, if I had a prescription pad, I would write out a prescription for each one of you to do this. Apply a large dose of humility. Take a big, big piece of humble pie and swallow it at this point in time. Because it's the humility that's going to help you surrender these hobbling expectations that you have for people, for yourself, for others. So to unhook myself and other people from my expectation, I have to remind myself that I am not here to live up to your expectations and you're not here to live up to mine. I've got to come back to that. Every step is to help us obtain, attain humility and to deepen that humility so it becomes the bedrock foundation to our life. So the final thing I'll say about this, and I'll invite my esteemed colleagues in to comment on what I've said tonight that a spot check inventory, and this is Bill Wilson, is what he says about this. He says, a spot check inventory taken in the midst of such an emotional disturbance can be a very great help in quieting our stormy emotions. We can recover our emotional center of gravity that we lost because of our expectations, because of our projections. And we can get centered again and now let the best of us do the talking for the rest of us. And let the best of us speak to the best in the other person we're dealing with. This step is incredibly important in achieving emotional sobriety because it's bringing together all that we've learned in the first nine steps to now how we function in the here and now, right now, here today. Because it's in this moment that your life is going to change, not by in the past. It's going to be what you do right now is you're going to either be supporting yourself, achieving emotional sobriety or not. So let's have a big hallelujah for step 10, right? We're rocking it with step 10. That's right. Let's all get into this. <laughs> step 10 is where it's at, baby. Mm -hmm. All right, Tom and Roger, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening, Alan. Good evening. Go, go Roger. Ahead, you, no, no, Roger, you, you go this time. Uh, I, I, I'm a muddle of, of thoughts right now, seriously. All right. All so right. if you've got right. some clarity about what uh, you want to say, oh, go I ahead. Have, I, well, no, I have, I have the, I, unlike you, I don't have any, any, I don't wait for clarity to speak. <laughs> <laughs> He's I, never been. I, never I, been no, no. I, I am. I. Uh, I always say, and I'm sure there are. My my wife is somebody who has the speakers on inside. You know, you you're probably like that, Roger. Is my guess is is so you think things through, and then you'll hear from. Is I my speakers are on the front porch, and so so it's like I always tell people: if you want to know what I'm thinking, all you have to do is stand near me, and 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 be, and because because of that, uh, I, I give my clients fair warning that that I may that it's it's not unusual for me to halfway through a session go you know the thing. I said earlier, I no longer agree with it. You know, it's like I've changed my mind entirely. So it's all in process. It's um, it's it's part of the part of the whole process. But anyway, I I will start. I love what you're doing uh, with this. Um, I love the, the the step of integration. Perfect. It's just we're stepping out. We're going into this thing. I want to. I'm just going to reread what I wrote last time because I've been rereading it all week, and it just is. It comes from listening to you. Last time, uh, Alan is, and I wrote, uh, humility is freedom from perfection. Uh, this is kind of what step 10 brings us to. I think humility is freedom from perfection, and freedom per from perfection heals self-hatred. And uh, that's, that's to me, I just, I've been, just been holding on to that for the week from last time. I, I, love, I thought that that was so great that you said, and by the way, you have been now labeled in the mm -hmm. chat room is ready, fire, aim, Tom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> except for, it. except for, I think they can take, you can take the aim out. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> There's no aiming to it at all. Ready, ready, 
throw it out there. We'll yeah. throw it out there and see what see what there is. Yeah. And uh, but let me just say a couple of things about that I have thought and, and written down as we've talked. It's it's um the it reminds me what it reminded me of is something that you and I I think we've talked about in our podcast before, but I've been something for years I've been calling uh, living by the regret reduction program. And, and that is, but, you know, living each day in, in, in the, in the way, you, in the best way you can do that so that you are not likely to regret later. It, we, we can't do that perfectly, but the, but the image I, or the, the, the metaphor I give is like, if you're at the end of your life, if you're, if you're given this particular day, you know, November 11th, you know, 2021, you want more days than not, at least, to, to be able to say, let it ride. It's okay. That was that was okay. Not perfect, but I don't have any big regrets from that. So, and I think that's what step 10 does. It, it, it does fit into the regret reduction program because when we become, when we, when we really become more masterful of using the pause button, which is what you were talking about, of of and just going slower. Uh and uh and based on my description of myself, you know, you know, is, is, is just spouting stuff out. You can imagine that's actually been one of my challenges is to, is to, is to, to go slower and to think through things first. And it's like, but I'm, I'm better at it. And it's like to hit that pause button and to be able to, it's one of my favorite things to be able to recognize, you know, a misstep, you know, it, it, as soon as possible, you know, and I really, and I do believe we, we should, we should measure, measure our progress in recovery by response time. Uh, so the idea is sometimes people can still beat themselves up because it's like maybe, you know, two days later and I'm thinking I shouldn't have said that to Alan, da, 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 da. but it's like, you know what, two days compared to what? two days to compare to like infinity. It's like, I used to never have that awareness. So, so if it's two days, then I need, you know, then I need to be brave and go ahead and, and have that conversation with you and, and, you know, trust that you're, that you'll, you'll be able to hear me do that. And if you don't, and if you don't, then, then I, you know, then my job is to keep working on that and not take that personally and know that, you know, that I've done the best I can do that. Cause the idea of the regret reduction program is the, the goal of every day is not at the end of every day. And ultimately at the end of my life is, is not happiness. It's, it's uh, self-respect, you know, it's, it, that's what this is about. It's self-respect and, and integrity. And that's, that's what step 10 to me really is about the last, the last four. I was just looking at it as you were talking in the 12 and 12, the last four, uh, words in that chapter is sleep in good conscience and i think yeah. that's what we want to do we want to we want to do we want to take good care to to be the respectful the, the people we can be proud of that we can feel good about and one of those things about that is because the, the, i'll say this the last thing the step because this is step step 10 is where we we emerge as students of life as a daily practice yeah, that's the every day. Our job is, is to learn. And I love what you said about the idea of of and when, you know, because, it's you know, because it's not always everything's, you know, not all on us. It's it's, you know, it's, it's the idea of and I, I, I will say this. I, I know I said I was going to wrap it up, but it's some when we say something wrong with us, I, you know, I think that can have such a, a, a negative connotation to us we need to look at language sometimes about stuff like that what i what what i what i translate something wrong with us is there's some work to do if i am upset if i then there is always work to do and some of that may be and i like what you said before some of it may be to address myself confront myself deal with my with my own shortcomings but one of those shortcomings might be just the fact that i really didn't do anything wrong but but i need i need to be forgiving and I like that you included that. So, yeah, you know, I, it's one of the words I've been playing with instead of wrong. Something's off with myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, but see, I'm just thinking it's just something, something else with work to do. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's, 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 it's no, sort of like that takes the judgment out of it. See, is yeah. what we're trying to do is, is we're removing that judgment because we don't, yeah. we don't need to put ourselves down. It's not about putting ourselves down. Right. It's about 
taking responsibility. Well, but the word and I and we can, I don't want to get off of this too much, but but the words themselves don't really don't really do anything to say to say something is wrong. It's fine. But we just have a way. I, I have a way of here. I need to own it myself. I have a way of hearing that. I think I've heard it in my in my own head for so many years. Something's wrong with me. You know, yeah. it's, it's it's like, you know, it's like I'm flawed in some t- horrible way, you know, but we're all flawed. It's just, you know, there's lots of things wrong with us. That's like, well, I, I've always said that the, the more stupid I've realized I am, the smarter I've become. Yeah, I love that. I heard you, I remember the first time I heard you say that. I thought that is, that is, that's perfect. Yep. Hmm. Roger, do you have clarity? <laughs> you, you you may be the only person in my life who's ever suspected that I really think things through before I speak, Tom. So, oh my God. Uh, so so I I I appreciate the thought, but but I wouldn't I wouldn't put too much too appreciate much credi- thought, credi- credibility wrong. into that. But you're yeah. wrong, Rutledge. Right? But you're dead wrong. Um a couple of things. One is I've I've kind of, as Alan knows, I've always got like this antenna out. Uh, except with my own words, a lot of the time I think for how for how people might be hearing what what Alan's saying or you're saying Tom or I'm saying. And again, I just I'm going to hasten to add we're, we're not saying that we're supposed to be totally stoic, non-reactive, and non-emotional in our functioning in our life. These are all issues of matters of degree, even emotional dependency. I think we're talking about excessive emotional dependency, even with expectations. We're talking about unreasonable or unrealistic expectations. So I know I'm I'm starting to feel like a broken record, but I always feel the need to come in and say, you know, things can be said in somewhat dramatic or black and white terms. And in real life, in my experience, they're not they're not that black and white at all. There are many, many shades of gray with these ideas. And you know, if I'm going through my day and somebody says something that I respond to or react to with my feelings being hurt, or I respond to something somebody says or does by getting pissed off or angry, or I respond with feeling ashamed or humiliated or put down, more likely to happen if there are other people present as well, right? And I'm feeling like I'm, I may be losing face with them. And what Alan's saying, and Tom as well, is these are all grist for my internal mill, right? These are all reactions that I'm having that if I do take some time to take a breath, a few breaths, to slow myself down, and that's the hardest thing, right? Because the the emotion center areas of our brain, the amygdala and others get stimulated, and man, they just want to override our our frontal lobes, our frontal cortex, and just have a field day, right? With our words and with our reactions. And as all of us know, it, it, it takes practice and time to slow that reactivity down and turn it into response. For me, breathing two or three slow breaths is very helpful. The way I think of it is the stronger my internal reaction, the more I need to slow myself down. Okay. That that's the formula for me is like, as soon as I, not because my reaction doesn't necessarily make sense. And if it's an incredibly rare situation where I really actually would need to physically defend myself or something, then the speed of that reaction can be important. But for 99% of the situations I encounter, my reactions are much more of the order that, that Alan has been talking about. I get something activated in me and then I just fly into to a reaction. So breathing helps me slow down a lot. Feeling my feet on the ground helps me slow down a lot. You know, seeing what's in front of me instead of going into memories or, or fantasies helps, helps me slow down a lot. So th- those are some things that, that I just wanted to add by way of this process. The other thing, again, Alan listed like six things, right, that are good, good parts to look at in terms of um, doing this spot check inventory. This takes practice, you guys, <laughs> okay? This takes focus and it takes practice and it takes a lot of self-forgiveness and a lot of willingness to work with myself or oneself. Um, 
to slowly begin to build these steps into our our responses to people Mm -hmm. and to situations. So those are just a couple of added pieces I, I thought I thought I would toss into the mix here. Um, well, that's right. why I have you guys here because of what you guys do. Thank you both for your wonderful contribution. So let's open it up now, Tom, to the to the community. I hear a lot of people criticize the 12 steps that they're old fashioned. I can understand that criticism. They were written back in 1935. Some people that are agnostic have difficulty with the word God used in the steps. For me, I look at the process that's involved, the forces that the 12 steps generate are so powerful that I think they're ageless. There's this interesting phenomena that happens when you work the steps. They create a a charge and then a discharge. You know, the first step, we're powerless. Our life has become unmanageable. It creates this charge. You know, we're in big trouble and we don't know what to do. And then step two comes along and it says we have hope. That charge, that existential crisis that we have is resolved. What's happening here? is parallel to life. We charge ourselves when we breathe in. When we exhale, we discharge. That's the rhythm of life. And the way I love to think about the 12 steps, it's helping us get connected to the rhythm of life so we can learn how to show up in a good way.